over. An interesting topic related to how to make it work is how much testing do you envision as a car manufacturer before you can sell it to a real customer? Do you have to test it for months, for years? That depends on the functionality. And normally that's added to the tier one suppliers. So for example, if you buy a camera system that does better street detection, they guarantee the performance. If something goes wrong, then it's their responsibility. So it makes testing quicker. No, that means that the tier one suppliers do all the testing. And normally what they do is that they have huge farm servers with huge data sets over thousands of miles all over the world, hand annotated and testing their algorithms. So I think that's why there is a big scope for research and development in the area of using simulation tools. I think um, somebody was presenting before on this. Um, Using some sort of virtual reality, there are as well um, available tools. For example, Task Prescan provides a simulation environment when you can model the physical properties of, of the environment, you can model the physical properties of the camera, and then you can basically test your algorithms against different lighting conditions, different weather conditions, different coverage conditions, which should give you some sort of indication of how well it performs. Sure. Um, I'll follow on, probably the big project I have with the server and the patches and the new lab. Um, I, I look after the V2X connected side of things, and I'm very interested to see a lot of what you do that you can share across different parts or, or even phones. So, a lot of the questions I was asking was to do with trying to break down the, the amount of transmission from one car to another, but still using the data well enough. So, I'd like you to, in the future, just, just kind of think about how we can improve that connectivity and what kind of information can be used from the other car position. Because that's growing up a lot over the next few years. But we just to see what your views on that. Thank you. The application that the tier one suppliers are collecting huge amounts of data on their vehicles to do serious testing. Yeah. Um, so from our perspective, it was very expensive for us to collect our 1,000 kilometer data set, uh, which is still orders of magnitude bigger than the kitty data set, which I've seen a few times people use today. So from that respect, maybe the collaboration between academia and industry, the route from research through to uh, building products that people use, maybe it should be not just a one-way street, but two-way in that you know, Mobileye, for example, uh, I went to a talk a while ago, they said they had over 80 million miles of recorded data uh, covering every kind of condition. Uh, that would be extremely valuable, uh, well, it is extremely valuable for them, but if the academic community had access to it, maybe they could come up with some solutions that industry is interested in. Yeah. So maybe opening up a, a two-way street from what industry is interested in who have the manpower to collect these huge data sets and then the academics who are coming up with new algorithms to, to deal with what industry wants. I think the, the, the issue with this is annotation as well, because they annotate very specific for the functionality they want. So they will have huge amounts of data, but you would have to manually annotate it. But I think that's making the raw data available is mm -hmm. the big thing. Once you have that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the kitty data set, they didn't provide any uh, pixel-wise annotations to begin with. Mm -hmm. So some researchers started doing 10 frames here, 50 mm -hmm. frames there, and then someone's gone and collected them all in one place. So I think the community will pick this up if they think it's useful. It's just having the information in the first place. Okay. Well, you have something that you can do before they go to the hospital. You, for example, Get back to school somewhat regularly. Mm -hmm. We have the tools where you can actually build a quick and construction and you were able to make sure free profile doesn't take that much time to label every single thing, every single image, right? Mm -hmm. So in the past people use Kenny and can be able to relabel per frame independently and it took I don't know 20 minutes per image to label because I don't know how many images that they provide. But they said a little 10 minutes to wait for some of the things you can do just to do that and also the things. How available are those tools? Is it open source? Yes, yes, open source is open source. So what I showed actually was that uh, some of the library for what I recited, that's what they call semantic frame, frame brush, and that's a direct extension of the semantic frame, which published last year. And this is a tool for interactive labeling of 3 d point parts, and it's available in the so. 
you will have to put the graph of this and you will have to that you just use it to report any more like only for three then just like on three to the data on the graph. Sorry, that's only for static things on the graph. You can't. Yes, yeah, so obviously, it's for static things. So obviously, we will use the graph. Good point. Yeah. It's not particularly high quality imagery, but YouTube is filled with hundreds of hours of dash cam footage of people having all the accidents. Rare in the other days. I think that's quite potential. So, I don't know why Gary is going to look at um, a lot of tattoo. It'd be that um, if you look at other areas of computer vision, then they're moving more and more towards kind of online data mining, trawling, that type of stuff. But at the moment, what we're doing in automotive. We're, we're maybe not leveraging that large quantity of low-quality footage, um, which is available. Because you're right, the outlier, the outlier cases are probably always there in low quality. The inlier cases are probably not even in your your extensive data set that you, you gather in Oxford. Um, so that's that's maybe something to bear in mind. Yeah. Um. I think Mobileye's uh, CEO mentioned that they're developing a standard for landmarks. It's about 10k of landmark data per kilometer. With that sort of thing perhaps leading towards a standard, is there a chance that that could be made available in its early stages by the industry so that academia can start pointing towards what they've got to recognize to answer the where am I question? I think at the moment there is no standard like that. And for example, from what I understand, it will be like is saying that they are developing this standard. They are probably developing it internally and they will not release it to the public because of their business model. They control quite a big portion of the market. So they will probably develop something that they can sell and take more market on. So I don't think they will they would release it. That's my personal view. And there are as well competing um, uh, approaches. So, for example, um, some of the German manufacturers, BMW, I think Audi and Volkswagen, got uh, Nokia gear maps, where they are going to do full 3D scan maps of uh, like German cities and probably more in the future. <coughs> so, that's kind of competing approach to what Mobile is proposing, and then all their tier one suppliers are proposing their own methods on their own platforms. So, I don't think any have to do with one automotive standard. Well, I guess that then might also be something that comes out of future future regulation. Because at the moment, you know, the regulation in the UK from the government white paper is largely kind of passive fair. But at some point, if you're going to sign off on a safety case, then you may want to test a test set for that. And potentially, that's something that would come out that's been used in other areas, for example, on CCTV. Um, yeah. Sorry, just to, to, to add to this, there are some UK consortiums doing some testing when we released to the public to set a degree. I can't release too much information at this point, but if we keep in touch, we can uh, point in the right direction if it comes to public. Um, so there will be some information, but I, I agree there's some IP issues, there's the legislation issues, and also the, the, the danger of um, the press trying to use the data unwittingly. So I do appreciate the situation you're in, but I think, I think we need to think about what we can and can't release and um, take that back home again. I think uh, definitely with, in the UK now for work that's funded, for research work that's definitely funded essentially by the primary UK research fund of the UK Research Council. So going forward, all of that data will be available because that is known that data. Uh, so it depends on, on the, the, the nature of that underlying fund. But on that note, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, how does it work with the EU funded project? So the work on the EU funded project. Is some of the data released back to public? You know, where, where are the, the reports? How, how does it come back in any way to the, to the public domain? Yeah, it does. I just got to find out where to find it and tell you. Um, there's a lot of uh, European and UK um, consortiums getting together. Uh, with the idea of sharing that. There's also the car-to-car -car consortium that's trying to make sure all of the uh, um, all of the OEMs are talking to each other, making sure we're following the same um, requirements. So you need, for example, there might be a, there's a criteria which we all must meet. So when one car talks to another car, at least he understands it. So there, is, there are some things happening in the background, and maybe that's the route for sharing, you know, so maybe putting it to the car to car consortium and saying, look, you know, guys, we need to be 
no way to some of that data, we will agree on doing something and perhaps put that forward and get something to you. But it's a fair point, we really do understand the point. It's just a case of what do you need and also what can we ask for, what do you get at the end of the day? And I think the cards are and so it will be a good start. And obviously I'll try and get some background or updates as to where, when the uh, other consortiums have the public data, so I'll leave that to the interaction. Right. Yeah, I really like the point about uh, the failure cases. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think is really interesting is there are failure cases where the algorithm swears on its life that what it predicts is right. Mm -hmm. And that might be logic or something, but uh, understanding when that happens and what kind of additional data would be needed to, to actually dis uh, to detect that. Uh, to take that into account, I think this is an important part in not only here on the vision for autonomous vehicles, but vision in general, getting a good understanding of what are the, uh, the failure cases, what are the half failure cases. That's, that's a very interesting call. Just to give some background on there is a question the same in the Airbags. Uh, the Airbag technology basically takes a new force on the Will, if it decides that that sequence of calls is like is the airbag, it will go off. Uh, we don't tend to hear an awful lot about airbags going off being corrected. Uh, so the, the industry has got over the past 10 or 15 years to the point where we're confident enough to put the virus out into the driver's face. So that's really sort of going to be sort of in five ten years. Is it five to ten years? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> When was the first time I talked to No, 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 no. Before uh, vision systems are, are left to control the cars. Vision systems are already controlling the cars. They're back on. No, they will break for pedestrians. And that's the thing that we have around. So the vision system, 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 system at the moment does have the capability of what Yes, it's a good thing. 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 But yeah, I think it's five years old, but then it can't be for the last ten years. So, <laughs> so Vision will never be fully controlling her. If you think about autonomous car as such, Vision will not be fully controlling it. You will have to have redundant systems because then the fire autonomy that we're talking about is the driver can be completely out of the loop and you you can't expect the driver to get back in the loop, which means you have to have a safe mode. Something fails, you need to know how to get the car to a safe state. So you, you need to drive it for another half a kilometer before you find a safe spot to stop. Then, because camera system fails, you need to have built-in redundancy because you, you can't just not have a system that will allow you to get to the safe spot. But that could be another camera. <laughs> no, because the cameras have their failure modes in terms of operating conditions. So it's dark, you don't have light sources, the camera just doesn't see anything. We need a different modality that in this particular conditions, it can still see the things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question of regulation. But at yeah. the moment, you're not allowed to do that with a human driving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The point is that if the human would do it, then you're choosing to do it. So if you've got lots of redundant cameras, it can, it can operate in any condition you want. But so it doesn't necessarily. That is not the case because you have the issues of dynamic range, you have the issues of the of the camera. So cameras are better than human you know, are the the human eye is incredible camera in terms of dynamic range of what mm -hmm. you can actually see in the dark without increasing the noise spectrum. And those, having those cameras running at 30 frames per second, the what will that be? You speak to the biologist, that's how the human eye is rubbish.